you know, for me, I don't remember coming from Cuba. I don't remember. I, I could tell you stories and lies. I don't remember shit. I remember waking up in Union City and dipping white bread into olive oil and, and coming across the Lincoln Tunnel sitting on my dad's lap. That's all I remember about my father. But I'm writing a book. And in fact, right now I'm around this chapter. I'm beating around this chapter. I didn't know racism. I didn't know what an immigrant was. I was just a happy little boy, as happy as I could be. My father had died. Mm -hmm. Instead of Kennedy dying, my father died. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I played around. I was on 88th Street. But I had a problem, Rudy. I always knew I wasn't, there was something missing. Like, because I spoke Spanish, I always thought I was never good enough. Mm -hmm. I always had that immigrant insecurity. Yep. There's this little immigrant yeah. insecurity. Yeah. Then things started happening. I saw a little Chinese guy smacking white people on TV on Sunday nights. And his name was Bruce Lee on the Green Hornet. And, mm -hmm. then, yeah. and then I got introduced to a baseball player named Roberto Clemente. Yeah. And he was Spanish, and he was a gentleman, and he was the best there was in the fucking league at the time. Yeah. And and I still remember him dying, like crying, and then Freddie Prince came along. Yeah. So all these people, these Latin, and then Ricky Ricardo, of course, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever, all these people gave you hope, like, Absolutely. oh, I could do something. Yeah. If Bruce Lee did it, if, if, if Freddie Prince did it, yeah. if Freddie Prince was from Spanish Harlem, yeah. He could do it. Another guy that was from the neighborhood that I really didn't know until you really, really, really investigate him is Tony Orlando. Oh, wow. He's Puerto Rican. Real, I know, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. And he was from either Union City or mm -hmm. West New York. Or, so seeing all this gave you that hope. Now, I was like you. I was a music guy. I, I still remember buying ABC by the Jackson 5 and you know, expand the Beach Boys, and then expanding. I didn't like people with long hair. I was Cuban. I saw, mm -hmm. I saw Pelu. Yeah, yeah. You know, Pelu, whatever Cubans call them. Yeah. So I would refuse to listen to rock and roll music. Mm -hmm. I listened to black music. Mm -hmm. I loved the OJs because of the influence of Harlem. But then something happened on the way to the dance. I went to my buddy's house, and we were going to listen to the White Album. All right. Uh, I had heard Help, the album Help by the Beatles. And I said, this could work. And they kind of had short hair at the time. Mm -hmm. So without knowing, we went to put the White Album on. And he had a brother who was a heroin junkie. It had to be 1972. And, you know, the guy was just, if you, you remember, I don't know if you remember the heroin epidemic. Oh, yeah. People would be nodding on the streets okay. in New York and waiting for the light to change, yellow and shit. So he comes out, and he's fucking nodding on his couch. He's just nodding. And I'm a little kid. I had known about heroin. I knew about cocaine from my mother's bar. I knew about marijuana, but I had never seen that. That fucking nod and drooling and shit. And then one of the nods, he popped his head up, and he goes, what the fuck are you little motherfuckers listening to? And his brother's like, well, listen to the Beatles. And he goes, take that shit off. I got something you motherfuckers got to listen to. And he put on Richard Pryor. I think it was the album, was it something I said? And I don't know if it was the Cuban in me. I don't know what it was. But whatever came out of that man's mouth was fucking magic. I went out and bought, like, I found three other Richard Pryor albums and I bought them immediately. And if you invited me to your party, to your house, I'd bring the Richard Pryor album. There's still people that talk to me that I'm still friends with. Ray Canella, uh, Richie Vanacek, and they've all told me over the last couple of years, do you know my mother still hates you because you brought over the Richard Pryor? Because we would, in those days, you put Richard Pryor on but you could always put an album on top for it to drop. So once that side ended, the album that was on top would drop. 
Yeah, yeah. So we would leave the Beatles on top. Yeah. And me, you, your friend, your cousin yeah. would sit in the basement listening to Richard Pryor. If we heard your mother coming down the yeah. stairs, we'd drop the Beatles and we'd start dancing. And then your mom would go, oh, you guys are having a good time. Yeah. And once your mom would leave, we'd put Richard Pryor saying fuck and cocaine and all this shit. I got thrown out of a bunch of people's houses for that. And it's funny that this week, somebody hit me up. His name is Lucio Fernandez. He's a Cuban kid I went to school with. We were bench pressing once in my backyard when we were like 12. And the weight slipped and hit him in the jaw. And his jaw was all fucked up after that. So my mother used to call him Lucky Hot. Lucky Every hot. time he came over, he'd go, Mira, quien está aquí, Lucky Hot, because his jaw was all fucked up. Lucio got into the soap opera business and did well. And now he's in charge of the arts in Union City. And the other day when I posted the Fox thing, he hit me up and he goes, I never really told anybody this except for one person I'm telling you. He goes, the reason I got into the entertainment business was because of you. Because you introduced me to the Honeymooners and you played that Richard Pryor album for me that time. I never forgot it. He goes, I never had the balls to listen to Richard Pryor or become a comedian. But I had the balls to act, and it was because of you. It was so weird that Richard Pryor, and I never looked at it as influential towards me becoming a stand-up comic. I thought it was something beyond realm to go in front of the stage and just talk to people. I didn't know that you rehearsed. I didn't know that you wrote jokes. I thought that you would just call up a bar and go, Hey, Rudy, what are you doing tonight? I'm coming down. Put the microphone up. Tell the camera to get there. I'm going to do a special. I swear to God. That's what I thought comedy was. I didn't know that you had to rehearse it and write it and try the material out for a year. I had no idea. When I listened to Richard Pryor, I was just a fan. I went to see Eddie Murphy Delirious. I went to see Eddie Murphy Raw. And at that time, I still wasn't thinking about comedy. Nothing. 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 It was such a thought that was so far away from me. Even though I loved laughing and I loved everything to do with it. So it's so weird that I, Friday, Lucio called me. And he goes, I never told. He goes, I even posted on my Facebook page. And the next day, another friend of mine called me, Ray Canella, who for years ended up at Sci-Fi. He was a big shot at Sci-Fi. And he quit because he didn't like where programming was going. So he started his own YouTube channel for horror people. People like horror movies from all over the world. And he charges seven bucks subscription. And he's happier and doing a lot better than he ever did fucking uh, being an executive. But the point being that I always loved that freedom of going up on stage and talking. I always admired it. I never thought I could do it. I, there was a time I wanted to be a musician. I took bass lessons at because I was a singer, but then my voice changed. When I, I was in a band in the sixth grade, and my voice changed, so I couldn't sing no more. So now I had to do something else. I had too big a fingers to play the guitar, so the guy at Pastoral Music told me just to play the bass. I tried it for like six months. I didn't like it, and I gave it up. And then I, after listening to like that, I finally, once I smoked pot at 13, I started listening to music where people had long hair, and that was it. You know, once I heard Led Zeppelin, that was it. I wanted to jump off a fucking building. And then it was Bad Company, Led Zeppelin, and then Black Sabbath came a little later, and I was scared of Black Sabbath because of my Catholic beliefs. I was very scared of Black Sabbath. I only had Paranoid and the Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath. And then I bought Sabotage, and that was pretty deep. But then my mother died, and I kind of lost faith in Catholicism. And one night I did angel dust, and I went home, and I put on Master Reality, and I thought I was going to shoot myself in the fucking head. I wouldn't listen to Master Reality. I'll tell you how Catholic I was. I would put on Houses of the Holy, but I would skip over no quarter. How come? Because it would scare the shit out of me. Hmm. The song scared yeah. the shit out of me, and I can and I love the guitar. I am a fan of mm -hmm. 
David Gilmore. I am a big fan of Eric Clapton's. I'm a fan of, you know, so many different styles of guitar playing, you know. Last night I was listening to the Cars Candy Out. That motherfucking little guy from Long Island could tear the shit up out of a fucking guitar. But I always knew that because of my cocaine habit that I would always sell my guitar. I could never get into playing the guitar because eventually I would sell my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> How many guitars did you own back None. in the day? None. None. Because I knew that <laughs> eventually if I bought like a, a Stratocaster or some type of fancy guitar... Yeah, yeah. I would sell it in one of my co Yeah, uh, you'll be surprised how many famous uh, musicians went through that too. That they had habits and they had to sell their in instruments and then, you know, borrow from somebody else and shit. Yeah. So the easiest thing I could do was stand up. And it all came together. Like it all came, like it's amazing how it all came together. I was scared of doing it because I knew it was going to be my savior. You know, I have so much respect, of course, for you and, you know, some of my other, you know, stand-up friends. Because, I mean, to get up on stage by yourself with just a microphone and you, that's it. It's got to be one of the most scary moments of your life. How do you do it? <clears throat> I think that they did like a survey and I think that people's two biggest fears are death and fear of public speaking. What got me started on this little fucking contradictory uh, thing I went through, it wasn't a depression. Like most people go through mind things. It wasn't a depression. It wasn't uh, anything like that. It was, I went to an open mic one night and I sat there and I thought about something that was really a pathetic fucking situation. I watched these comedians and I figured out in my head just from watching they were just at the four year mark. And all of a sudden I thought of something that a Cuban would say to you, like a Cuban father would say to you. ¿Quién cojones tú crees que tú puedes ser cómico hacer? ¿Quién pinga te dijo a ti que tú puedes ser cómico? In other words, yeah. what I'm saying is that somebody who was intelligent would look at you and go, who the fuck told you you're funny? Yeah. Who the fuck even gave you an inclination that you could do this? At the four-year mark of comedy, there's a lot of things going through your mind. There's a lot of doubt. If it's not going your way, there's a lot of doubt. I was trying to figure out what kept me going every day. Like, what kept you playing the bass again? What kept you... You ever been on a tour that you were unhappy on? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You, did you quit? Um, well, I did not quit the tour. I, I fulfilled my commitment. And then you quit. Then I quit. Right, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm like you. Uh, I don't like doing shit I don't like doing, you know. And it's really weird with comedy. In the beginning, it's not what you think. You're going to a fucking comedy club, and it's a bar with a ping pong table, and the Laker game is on. And you got to do comedy while the Laker game is on. And nobody wants to see you. You know, when I go to the comedy store, I go to the comedy store with a pre... I have an idea psychologically that I'm about to laugh. When I go to a bar, it's to pick up a gram of blow and get my dick sucked. I'm sitting at a bar talking to a girl. Now you get up on stage and do comedy. But back to what you asked me, that really messed with me. Like, who the fuck told you at the four-year mark you should continue with this? I started thinking about what made me, what, you know, like what makes you keep going. Like, when you're on a tour with Whitesnake, that was a huge tour. Now, those are two albums, right? Those are two albums that yeah. were huge. Yeah, we took a, uh, a, a bit of a break to do the uh, the follow-up record, Slip of the Tongue, yeah. But yeah. we were on, on, on the road for the, the 87 record for a year and a half. Straight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, straight as far as, you know, you take like one or a week off and then pick up another leg because it, 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 it made sense to stop, you know, to like tour for six weeks in a, in a certain part of the world then ship your equipment. It will take about a week, week and a half to get to another part of the world. 
Meanwhile, you, you just take a break during that, you know, while, while the equipment is traveling.